Welcome to Lesson 4 of the New England Fly Tires Video Manual of Fly Tying. I'm Dean Clark, your host for this series. The fly featured in this lesson, the Warden's Worry, is similar to the streamer you tied in the previous lesson, but there are some significant differences that are the basis of five new skills. We hope that you've been making liberal use of the half hitch using the tool. Perhaps you've wondered why half hitches haven't been made at the back of the fly. The reason is that the hole in the tool will not allow you to reach to the back of the fly. Half hitches are certainly recommended following every tie-in step, including the tail and with all body materials. Well, the first new skill covered in this lesson will show you how to put a half hitch at the back of or anywhere else on the hook shank, not with the tool, but with your fingers. As you learn this manual half hitch, be aware that it will give you a head start on the manual whip finish, which comes up in lesson six. One other point. Assuming you have mastered the loose loop over, start thinking about how you might do a loose loop under. You'll be using it as you learn another method of fly tying of the throat. As you can see, each new skill mastered becomes a foundation building block that allows you to progress comfortably as you continue adding to your knowledge bank. So, let's move on to lesson four and the Warden's Worry. The Warden's Worry, an old pattern from the state of Maine, is also an attractor fly whose color scheme is somewhat similar to the Dark Edson Tiger of lesson three. If the red tail looks familiar, it's exactly the same as the tail of the woolly worm. The throat is similar to the tail of the Edson Tiger, except for the location. The bodies of many fish have a metallic sheen when the light strikes them at just the right angle. Perhaps you've seen fish flash as they feed below the surface. Experienced anglers are always on the lookout for this telltale flash. No doubt that hungry fish are also on the alert for the flash of a bait fish. The metallic ribbing that adds flash to this and other streamers is borrowed directly from the ultimate in attractor patterns, those classic salmon flies, many of which feature tinsel ribbed bodies. Here's Dave Flint to brief you on the materials used to construct the warden's worry. Hi, there are five materials in the Warden's Worry, three of which you already know about. Red duck quill, yellow hackle, and brown bucktail for the wing. The body will be constructed of a yellow-orange wool yarn. Wool, now the yarn comes in a variety of thicknesses. This depends on the number of strands that make up the yarn. Sometimes you'll find it necessary to split the strands to avoid making a bulky body. This yarn has four strands to it. Considering you'll be wrapping two layers on the hook, two strands should be about right. The wool body will also be ribbed with a narrow oval gold tinsel. The hook will be a number eight 6XL streamer hook, and the thread will be black. Now, here are five new skills to add to your growing repertoire. The thread is already on the hook and lacquered. It's been half hitched at the front, but it could use another half hitch at the back. Your fingers will be the half hitch tool. You will need about eight or 10 inches of thread. With the bobbin in the left hand, make a V for victory sign with the right and lay the fingers across the thread. Think of your fingers as an enlarged version of the half hitch tool and make one turn of thread around them. Now rotate the hand toward you so one finger is above the other, and place the loop onto the hook. Position the thread exactly where you want the half hitch to be as you bring both fingers below the hook. Withdraw the index finger and use it to trap the thread against the back of the hook to keep it in place. Take the other finger out of the loop and pull straight down on the thread to tighten the loop. The thumb can be used to keep the loop away from the point. 
Let's see that again at normal speed. The secret of keeping the hitch where you want it is the finger that holds the thread against the hook. Select and cut a quarter inch section of fibers from the sweet spot of a red dyed duck quill. This could be tied in exactly the same as on the woolly worm, but Dave prefers a double tail, so he's cutting another slip from a matching feather. The two slips are then aligned with the concave sides together. The double tail is tied in the same as a single tail. Do you remember the principle regarding the tie-in sequence of materials on ribbed bodies? All body materials must be tied in before any winding begins, so the ribbing goes on first. Bring the thread forward to just back of where the head will be. Cut a piece of yellow wool yarn about eight or 10 inches long and unwrap a single strand. Tie it in at the front tie point, trim the excess and half hitch. Wind the wool back to the rear tie point. While winding material back, use the left hand to bring the material over the top and away, as the right hand takes it under and towards you. Just the opposite of what you do when winding forward. Make sure you cover the thread winds at the rear. Now reverse direction and bring the yarn back to where you started.
one more turn forward before tying off. There should be enough room left for the throat, wing, and head. Wind the tinsel in the opposite direction. This counterclockwise winding prevents the tinsel from disappearing into the spaces between the turns of yarn. One of the characteristics of the warden's worry is its fuzzy body. To fuzz it up, pick out the wool with the bodkin. The object is to create a rough, undefined, translucent outline. One old timer uses a piece of fine-toothed hacksaw blade for making fuzzy nibs. And a dental tool used in root canals has been adapted in a commercially available fly tire stool. Even a piece of Velcro mounted on a handle works great. Well, just one more new skill to go, tying on a strip tackle fiber throat. Now, actually, it's a combination of two previous skills with some slight differences. The first of these previously learned skills is the hackle fiber tail of lesson three. The preparation of the material is exactly the same. Where it's tied in is different. The second learned skill is the loose loop over, except that it will be done upside down. It's a loose loop under. The first time you try it, it can be tricky. Now, I guess you could turn the hook upside down and skip learning how to do a loose loop under, but you'd only be cheating yourself. Another difference between this skill and that used to tie in the throat of the dark heads and tiger is that the fibers will not be on the stem. There'll be no opportunity to pull the fibers to the proper length. Therefore, you'll have to position the fibers properly before tying them in. Although slightly more difficult than the previous method, it is the com most commonly used method of all, not only on streamers, but on wet flies as well. Having said that, I'll point out that in the wet fly of lesson six, you'll learn yet another throat technique. For now, let's go back to Dave at the tying bench. Remember, when stripping fibers from a hackle feather, pull the stem away from the fibers. Hold the fibers under the hook with the tips about one-third of a shank length back of the eye. Transfer them to the left hand and here's where the loose loop under comes into play. Form the loop on the underside of the hook and pull straight down. Add some secure wraps and carefully trim the excess, making sure the fibers are not blocking the eye.
here's a chance to review the preparation of the bucktail wing. Cut close to the skin, remember? Even the tips, as was done in the previous lesson. As you measure the length against the hook, don't make the wing too long. A long wing can wrap under the hook and get hung up on the bend when you fish it. That'll make the fly behave unnaturally, perhaps even corkscrewing in the current and on the retrieve. That can twist the leader tippet into a hopeless mess. Once you have the wing on, you can start to form the head. To keep everything secure, the fly is finished off with a couple of manual half hitches. In addition to the secure half hitches, Dave adds a drop of lacquer which gives a fine finished look to the fly. Here is Dave's warden's worry. How does yours compare? How many skills did you count? I counted 14 that were actually pictured, adding two more that when necessary but not shown makes 16 in all. Now I included skill number 11, proportion. And proportion applies to every fly. For each pattern has its own unique and correct proportion, or at least it should have. If you follow the directions regarding the measurement and placement of the various parts of the fly, the proportions of your fly should be correct. This is often the one skill by which others will judge your flies. Proper proportion is most important. Well, you've seen the usual method of fishing a subsurface fly in a river. Fishing in still water is quite different because there is no current. Ken Hull will demonstrate some useful methods of fishing a pond or a lake. Fishing the still water of a pond or lake is quite different than fishing the moving water of a river. In a river or stream, fish take up positions called lies. They use holding lies that offer the protection of cover and relief from the current, and they move to feeding lies when they're hungry, unless they're lucky enough to find a lie that serves as both. By noting currents, bottom structure, and likely cover, an observant angler can find the clues that a river offers. 
clues that can lead to the best fishing spots. But here, there are no visible clues, no detectable current. We can't see the bottom, and we have no idea of where the fish might be. The big difference is that moving water brings the food to the stationary fish, while in stationary water, feeding fish must move to find food, and moving fish could be anywhere. Water such as this seems to create an irresistible urge in some anglers to reach out with the longest possible cast, and casting is often random and disorganized. Fish do hold in certain spots in still water. Structure, weeds, spring holes, and the junction between stratified layers of warm and cold water called thermoclines are places where fish like to congregate. These likely holding spots are invisible to us. Oh, random casting will sometimes bring your fly through one of these fishy spots by dumb luck, but there is a better way. While you can't read the water with your eyes, you can read the water by applying an organized and systematic approach to your casting. It's simply a matter of planning and using a casting pattern relative to the water surface and down through the water column. So let's start again. The plan that Ken has in mind as he approaches the pond involves a fan-shaped casting pattern like the spokes of a wheel, using short casts that will cover the nearest water first. The idea is to search the water thoroughly. To avoid an overly long sequence here, Ken is spacing the cast wider than need be. There's plenty of room between the spokes to place more cast, and that would cover more water. The second fan-shaped pattern is made with longer casts. By starting the retrieve almost as soon as the fly hits the water, Ken is fishing near the surface. He could be fishing over deeper lying trout, which are reluctant to rise and chase his streamer. Delaying the retrieve to allow the fly to sink will probe the deeper water. And there is a method that will tell you your fly has sunk. It's called the countdown method. But to use it effectively, you'll need to know the sink rate of your fly. A simple experiment will tell you that. First, judge the depth of the water where you stand. Drop your fly and count how many seconds it takes to reach the bottom. Knowing that, you'll be able to control the depth of the fly. If it takes six seconds to sink three feet, it will take 12 seconds to sink six feet. Simple arithmetic. If you estimate the area to be about five feet deep and you want to fish a foot from the bottom, an eight second countdown will do it. Of course, with a floating line, the fly will tend to rise to the surface on the retrieve. A full sinking line or one with a sink tip will keep your fly down where you want it, but there's a way to keep it down with a floating line. That way is to make an intermittent retrieve, pausing every so often to allow the fly to sink back down.
If you are wondering why Ken has abandoned the fan-shaped casting pattern, I'll explain. It seems that when shooting a fishing video, fish will bite only when the tape isn't rolling. Probably something to do with Murphy's Law. While the camera was being repositioned, Ken made a cast to where he's casting now and had a solid hit that failed to result in a hookup. And that's the point. If you miss a fish in a certain place at a certain depth, try again. Maybe it was a fish just passing by, but it could be one of those fish holding spots. Sometimes it pays to let the fly sink all the way to the bottom. You can see by the way the line behaves as it is retrieved that the fly is dragging the bottom. This can result in lost flies if there are sunken logs, brush, or other obstructions, but there are times, especially in the early season, when fish will hold just inches from the bottom. In such cases, if you're not hanging up occasionally, you're not fishing deep enough. Probing the surface in a definite pattern covers the water in a systematic manner. The countdown technique lets you explore the water from top to bottom. If you connect in one of those fish holding areas, you'll be able to duplicate the successful cast.